Interoperability flood fest that has been, been running for the last three days here at the Lynn's offices. And um, thank you for, uh, for attending. I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction of who's who and who's been participating. Um, background, why we're here in the first place, what we're trying to achieve, and then take you through a live demonstration of the um, interoperability activities and, and uh, components we've put in place. And at the end of that, there's plenty of room for uh, some discussion and, and questions to, uh, to the technical people uh, if you have more questions as to how and why uh, and how things were done. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Stephen Bensberg from Linz to do a quick introduction uh, before we get started. Thanks, Rose. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge and thank um, all, of the, all of you as individuals and all of you um, in terms of the companies that you come from. Um, specifically, I first of all like to thank Peter for coming and for his um, expertise from QWorks and OGC. Uh, and we know from listening to conversations that your experience and expertise has been very helpful in helping us see better ways of doing things. But also specifically like to um, thank Sarah Skirt and Christchurch City Council. Um, it's taken us a wee while to get our visions aligned and to uh, for all of us to see things in a similar vein to make this uh, three-day workshop um, a success. But in particular, I'd like to thank Intergraph and Esri. Um, you know, these guys have provided a lot of support to Christchurch City Council, Sierra and Skirt uh, over the last 18 months with all the recovery activities. And I'd like to also mention, obviously, Eagle North South JS and SKM because it's their technical staff that are working for those, all of those agencies and uh, that have made this uh, three days possible. Um, you know, it actually takes quite a lot of effort to actually run one of these and because what you've got to do when you're here is you actually have to first of all lay down your own ideas and listen to what the other parties are saying in order for us to be able to move forward in one vision. One vision. So I'd really like to thank you for that on behalf of the Geospatial Office in Linz and I uh, look forward to the demonstration. Thank you. Thank you Stephen and uh, I hasten to add that uh, without Linz's initiative, drive and sponsorship of this event that would not have taken place. So thank you very much, uh, Linz. <coughs> so in early this year, uh, Linz actually commissioned a study uh, into a number of existing and uh, planned uh, geospatial projects that's happening in the Canterbury region that are all sort of uh, are related to the earthquake recovery to identify which ones of those would be most suited to further um, accelerate an SDI development in Canterbury and possibly in the future of the whole of New Zealand. So about eight vital projects were identified in that scoping exercise. And one of the most pressing ones uh, was uh, the need to further the interoperability between the, the key recovery partners uh, who are here today, Sierra, Skirt and Russia City. Uh, and then being, you know, uh, using different geospatial platforms was a key requirement that that will be done using open standards developed by the OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, um, and as mandated by Linz's uh, Geospatial Office uh, in their <coughs> SDI cookbook. It was clearly not to be an uh, academic exercise, but needed to deliver practical, implementable solutions because of the pressing business need of the um, recovery partners to actually share this information so that they can actually go on and do their job of rebuilding this city. So before, uh, and so that means the, the scope of the plug fest that we're here today um, was firstly to identify and diagnose what was stopping interoperability from happening. And to that, it needed to focus on the issue with existing open standards, um, notably specific standards, um, web services, uh, better known as web feature services, and web transaction web feature services. As I said, to generate, do that to generate immediate results that accelerate recovery and reconstruction efforts as well as SDI development, and then implement those solutions. And uh, if there are issues with particular products, um, you know, we'll make recommendations to those vendors of those products where relevant. So that's sort of the background context of where we're coming from. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with it, there'll be some jargon uh, into today's presentation. Uh, the five most um, uh, common 
acronyms we might be using are OGC, which is, stands for Open Geospatial Consortium, which is the standards organization that develops the standards that we're implementing here today. Some of those standards are the Web Map Service, which is a protocol for exchanging map images, the Web Feature Service, which is a protocol for exchanging geographic data, um, either as a read-only or transactional as a read-write um, service, and then the encoding of what you send down the wire is using a, a standard called GML, the Geographic Market Language. So you'll probably hear these terms a couple of times in the next uh, half hour. So the current situation is that Christchurch City holds a number of authoritative databases about the city and that are relevant to recovery. Um, we'll see wastewater uh, infrastructure and assets, and we'll see a, a future need uh, hopefully to be implemented our building status, and there's a whole range like that. Uh, and then there is a, a large number of construction partners um, who either collect or manage such data for their group, their area, of their work, and need to submit that to Christchurch City. Um, and um, at the moment that takes significant internal resources to collect that data, receive it, unpack it, validate it, um, and that doesn't really scale. You can't increase the number, of the amount of data you um, manage in that way without similarly increasing the number of resources you put in place. So the desire and really the only way for, for Crashed City is to make that data available that they have through web services so that people can self-serve themselves and get the data um, from Crashed City without human intervention. And likewise, and that's where the capability is really lacking at this time, is to receive these updates from their construction partners and other partners through web services such as WFST, so that that is automated uh, and um, can be managed with minimal uh, resources. So that's where we're at. So we put this plugfest together to start creating that capability. To do that, we create two use case scenarios, so realistic use case scenarios, an actual need, and, and on the back of that need, see if we can implement and plug the different systems together from the different organizations. Setting up the data, the services, some of it is sitting on the laptops you see around here, some of it is sitting on the servers in Christchurch City Council, some of it is sitting uh, in hosted environments in New Zealand uh, at North South GIS or uh, on the Amazon cloud. Implement that, make it work, implement end-to-end -end interoperability, and create a live demo, which is why we're here today. All that in this very, very compressed time space of three days. So I talked about <coughs> demonstration scenarios. We'll have two. We have the first use case about um, managing wastewater assets, where we see Skirt <coughs> creating uh, wastewater manuals in this case submitting that to Christchurch City Council and then have that used for project design purposes. We have a second use case with a similar workflow, but this case, CIRA, um, updating building status to Christchurch City and then have an insurance company um, read that for, to understand what the status of the different buildings in a certain area is. So let's go to the first one, which is the as-built um, submission. And, um, the sort of two part, the two players in this scenario are Crushed City, we're a geomedia intergraph environment, and uh, and Skirt. We'll see what's happened is that um, as the as built information is managed, gets submitted through a standard interface to Crushed City, validated, updated, and then used again. Uh, we'll see more details in the steps of this diagram. It's a bit busy. Um, but we'll go, let's go to the actual scenario. So st step one is that Steve, who's a spatial data manager, works for Skirt, um, and uses his ArcGIS desktop environment to maintain wastewater asset data. In this case, we'll see manholes. Um, Upstates that has the current um, database that it gets from uh, Chrysler City Council, makes the edits, uh, gets internal sign-off, and when he's done, um, submits those back into the Christchurch City Council database. Very simple um, and automated. So what I'll do now is we'll switch to um, Jay from um, Eagle Technologies who will demonstrate this step using the information on his laptop.
Thanks, Brent. Okay, so what I was going to do is take you through what uh, a typical operator at uh, Skirt would, would run through. So right now they're using the desktop tools uh, to, to digitize and maintain the wastewater <coughs> manholes. And um, this, uh, all of that information is going into an Esri backend. It's a bit of a slow process to get that back out into Christchurch City. So what we've done during the plug fest is uh, enable the desktop environment to communicate to uh, a WFST backend server. Right now there's no built-in uh, it's, there's no built-in support, that's because WFST is a, is a maturing standard. So what we have here is we've got a base map coming through from Skirt servers at, at Amazon, and we've got the wasteful water manholes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just follow the standard process of creating a feature within uh, the Esri desktop environment. So I'm going to digitize some water manholes, and you can see in here yeah, I've, uh, I've clicked on it. I can bring up my attributes. And uh, there's some certain required fields that Christchurch's uh, city need uh, for this data to come through. So uh, we have made these available via drop-down boxes to just make the data uh, inputs um, quick. That way we know that the data going through and the schema going through is going to be correct. Once I've done that, I'm going to save this. And these edits are being saved into uh, Skirt's system, Skirt's ArcGIS server in the back end. We now want to send it over to Christchurch city. And what we've done is we've actually created an add-in for ArcGIS desktop um, that we've dropped in here. And this add-in, once I execute it, essentially uh, takes this data out of the ArcGIS system and it runs a process to convert this data into what's called GML. And uh, GML, Geographic Markup Language, uh, it's an easy way of us being able to uh, push it through to Christchurch City. And what we, what we do is we run some transformation processes on it and uh, to apply the, uh, to actually create the transaction and then push it through to, to Crush City. So hopefully this will go through. So it ran, it ran through the export process and there we go, it's gone through. Uh, you can see that in here we've got uh, access number 168, uh, which is that ID that the, the WFST server on Crush City end has given us back. Thanks for that, Jay. Um, so what we've seen here, we go back to the original diagram, we've got Jay or Steve doing the RFG's desktop, adding a feature, a manual feature, to the ASPL, ASPL database, and then using the um, dedicated script, turn that into a GML and post that into the WFST, where it's now being received in the staging database. So that brings us to the next step uh, of our scenario. We're looking at Natalie, who is a uh, data manager at Crusher City, and her role and responsibility is to manage those um, submissions as they come along, so maybe once a day, uh, or when she gets a notification, she look at that, and she uses her internal desktop of uh, uh, GIS, which is a, a GeoMedia Pro, um, looks at the submissions that are done, maybe run some automated validation processes, do a visual inspection, and when it's all okay, um, she then passes that on into the production data environment. So we've got um, Chris from uh, Crashed City demonstrating that part of the workflow. So what we're looking at here is we've remote desktoped into our council environment. So we're, this is as if we're sitting back in our, our enterprise environment, back in the office. And um, Natalie has her desktop here with GeoMedia Pro, some background data here. And you'll see we've got a couple of different uh, legend entries over here. The wastewater access stage, which is where the data that's just been posted uh, will have been put into, and the, the, our normal um, production database of wastewater manholes um, being displayed. And I sh will just refresh with warehouse changes, and what will happen there is you'll see that this manhole here appeared. Uh, and so that's come in via the WFS feed. And we can have a look at the attributes that were entered in here and they will be exactly the same as the attributes that were passed in uh, from Skirt. Before Natalie can um, submit this into our production database, she's got to validate uh, any spatial connectivity rules like the manhole must connect to a pipe or various things like that. And actually um, Natalie has also actually got to choose which internal business uh, unit at the council is responsible for this particular asset. So she updates that. And then, once she's happy that it's all ready and approved, we change this awaiting approval status to approved, and it's okay. And that will now be um, 
submitted into the production feature class ready for other people in the enterprise to access. And so if we have a look at the count of wastewater accesses in our production system here, it is the last three digits are 532. And if I go warehouse, refresh with warehouse changes, you'll see that that count has gone up by one, showing that the, the data has gone from the staging table uh, across into our production system. It's been approved by the user and now it's ready for various people in our enterprise to use and is also um, automatically available by the various WFS feeds against that data for other people to use. Thanks very much for that, Chris. Um, so just uh, recapping there, what we're seeing is happily within Christchurch City Council Enterprise environment, environment using Geomedia Pro, <coughs> noticing the just submitted manhole, data validating it, approving it, for submission <coughs> and we saw it move into the production database. Very simple, using the local tools um, available to production city. So now it's available um, within production city. How is that made? How is that of use to, uh, to other users? Well, we've got Jo, who is a design engineer at Skirt, and she's planning uh, some works in Colombo Street. And for those works, she needs to be aware of where all the manholes are. Um, so she's got a, a skirt internal online bureau, which happens to be an RGS Flex client, and she connects that to Skirt's asset database. And she knows that that asset database is actually on a regularly <coughs> synchronized with the Russian City database. So on a regular basis, the Skirt will use the standard based interface to get from the geomedia environment the wastewater assets, place that in their own necessary environment, and push that out. Um, to all their internal users. And that's the way Joe knows that when she sends the crew out, she will have that crew, um, given that crew the latest available um, asset information, obviously, that will make their, hopefully, do their work uh, in a better way. So we'll go over to Todd here from Skirt to demonstrate that part of our use case. Todd. Todd's laptop is uh, trying to negotiate the right resolution with our projector. And uh, as we're waiting for that, so what Todd will show is those two things, the um, synchronization of its the Esri internal database with um, the uh, Russian city, and then Joe accessing that through a flex your Todd. Okay, so this is the FME, safe C for me, and um, it's a extract transformer load tool. And so what we're doing here is sucking in the council's uh, WFS from its production server and exporting out to a file G database, an uh, ESRI file G database. So we'll just give that query run. This query is just sucking in uh, around Cathedral Square, um, just so that we don't need to get all the information across the whole Christchurch. I'll just upload the G database. So at the moment, Skirt uh, runs their system from an Amazon cloud service, so I've just downloaded the geodatabase onto my particular laptop, and now I'm just sending it up to the cloud. So hopefully what are the benefits for using it, of using a cloud service for Skirt? Uh, pretty much it's the scalability, so easily deploy um, more uh, CPUs, RAM, hard disk space, and allows us to grow quickly with their increasing users. Um, so yeah, very useful, very dynamic. Right. And so you don't actually know where that is hosted, right? It's it hosted in Seattle. In Seattle, actually. Yeah. So we're live uploading the data we just got out of uh, crush your city to a secure environment in Seattle. Sorry, um, just, so what's happening now? Just starting the super stuff on the Nigeria. So we we'll go and if I refresh. Okay, so we've now synchronized the crush your city asset data with the S3 environment in Skirt and We'll be able to watch. Oh, 
Scott, what are we watching here? We did, this is the actual viewer, so mm -hmm. just wait for the imagery to refresh. And there's our new uh, map. Yeah, well, so that Joe can now look at. Um, so we've seen that. Thank you very much. All right, so that closes the loop. So we've seen um, Todd using SME to access again the standards interface um, to pull out the asset data, the manhole data um, from Crash and City, upload it to its ArcGIS server environment, which is sitting in the Amazon cloud, and then using the proprietary um, interfaces, um, look at the sort of web viewer and that man same manhole. Uh, came up there. So that closes the loop on that particular use case. Number of um, different technologies all communicating <coughs> with, with each other in real time because of the use of standards, interfaces, and encodings. So before this, we had the state really implemented, um, data such as asset data would arrive at Russia City on paper. On, as email attachments on disks and would take a significant amount of effort and a strain on the available limited resources to redigitize, reformat, validate and upload that every time something like that come in. So now that we have this capability in place, um, all that Crash City needs to do is set up the WFS transactional interface, the standard interface once publish its existence, publish the required data scheme or data model, and then can just walk away and just look, monitor whenever submissions are made and validate them for any some significant time and resource savings. Uh, and while at the same time, the organizations doing the submitting can still use and choose their own technology platform and their own internal business processes because of are using open standards to do this uh, interaction. Okay, so that's the end of uh, use case one. Uh, time to come up for air a little bit. Um, before we go to the next use, second use case, are there any questions or comments uh, from the room?